Thank you for the introduction, Alison. Um, as Alison's mentioned, this uh, webinar is all about high temperature testing, and particularly about testing uh, hard coatings, thin films, uh, right up to 950 degrees Celsius, but also there'll be a section about testing uh, advanced alloys and metallic materials, which are very useful for calibrating the, uh, and validating the test technique. So, but if we start off with thinking about uh, thin films and hard coatings, many of their applications are really high temperature applications, be they uh, in hot zones, in engines, in aerospace or automotive application, be they uh, metal cutting for such uh, engines, and a lot of high performance applications really involve a lot of frictional heating uh, and uh, high temperatures. So if we want to design coatings to uh, display long life in these applications, a typical strategy, a common strategy, is to combine levels of high hardness with, with uh, high levels of toughness, to try and develop hard uh, yet tough uh, coatings, as in this sort of schematic shown by Sam Zhang here. Uh, but if we think about it for a moment, this picture is not really sufficient, and what we really need to think about optimizing is these properties, not at room temperature, but at the temperature involved in the application itself. So we're really talking about high temperature hardness and mechanical properties. So in this example, you can uh, see these are three different commercial coatings, and these are the examples of the, how the hardness measured at temperature varies for these different uh, coating systems. They're all titanium aluminum nitride based coatings on cemented carbide substrate. And if we were to take just the room temperature hardness as the guide to how these coatings might perform at height in their applications, we might assume particularly this one in the red might be better than this one here. But in fact, if the temperature in the application is 500 degrees or so, then you can see really that this one has lost a large amount of its hardness. So its thermal stability and high temperature mechanical properties are greatly inferior to these other two here. So that just emphasizes the importance in actually doing the measurements at temperature. So this has been increasingly realized over the last um, 15 years or so. So this is uh, uh, an independent assessment of the number of publications in high temperature nanomechanics by a range of different manufacturers here. And the nanotest system, the microtest system is these uh, plus signs here. And you can see that we um, have been very active in this area. Our users have been very active in these areas both in producing the largest number of papers, but also in the highest temperatures. So actually what you can, it may look like it's uh, linear, but actually hidden in this um, graph, there are a couple of sort of regions where up until sort of around here, the temperature was limited to about 500 degrees, and then after that you see some, some higher temperatures, and we'll come back later in the uh, webinar as to what that might be. Okay, so in this webinar, I'm going to be describing several uh, different areas. I'm going to begin by talking about the general uh, considerations that we need to, to account for to get reliable high temperature nanomechanic measurements and indenter samples, design of experiments, and stability. After that, then I'll share some experimental results by our user base and how we can use this uh, methodology to test um, th hard thin films in an uh, argon perching atmosphere with um, cubic pore and nitride indent materials up to about 750 degrees. And then show how if we want to go to higher temperatures, how it's beneficial to move to high vacuum. And this is possible with the nanotrust extreme system. And as well as talking about coatings, I'll also uh, give some measurements datum on uh, uh, tungsten, which is a very important material for nuclear applications uh, in the next generation uh, fusion reactors, and its high temperature and mechanical properties are particularly important for that, so that's where the work has been done on that material. And then I'll finish off with uh, some work to show how we might get to even higher temperatures, and also the other types of nanomechanical tests that we can do it in our high temperature test capability in the nanotest systems, not just indentation, but also micro uh, compression or cantilever bending tests, and also micro and nanotribological testing. Okay, so the, the, the critical issues 
and general considerations for reliable high temperature nanomechanics. So the first thing you need to consider is, or is a prerequisite, is instrument stability. So you need to be confident that your, your heating does not affect the measurement electronics in your instrumentation. You also need to have uh, minimized contact drift. So, we, so essentially this is an isothermal contact to assure that there's no thermal drift across that contact between the indenture and the sample during the measurement. So this allows us to optimize the stability. Uh, but on its own, that's not really enough. So actually what we need to do is we need to consider two other factors. One is we need to allow, we need to be confident in our calibrations and we also need to be confident in our analysis to allow for the increased time dependency that we see, typically we might see in uh, materials behavior in indentation at high temperatures. So the creep is typically a lot more important at high temperatures and we need to understand how to deal with that and how to continue to get reliable elastic modulus measurements. And the, the final factor is really environmental stability. So we need to consider the degradation of the probe and the degradation of the sample and how we can avoid uh, those things to get reliable data. So we're not simply just measuring oxides that form a temperature. So as a history lesson here, if we, if we go back uh, 50 years or so in, into the literature, then before hot nano indentation was even considered, people were doing hot micro hardness testing. And how they would typically do it is they'd have a little uh, localized furnace there and then would heat up this area and then do a test. And data was quite reliable, but, but it was realized that actually the temperature of the indenture and the temp temp temperature of the sample were different and this was giving a problem. So over those last 50 years or so, instrumentation, instruments were developed where separate heating of the, the sample on the tip was done and this essentially uh, minimized the thermal drift and gave much more reliable data and there was uh, some good work done at Newcastle and also later at uh, Oxford and Bristol. A national physical laboratory on, on using this dual heating approach. So then when it comes to high temperature nano indentation, it's not that surprising that really we want to adopt a similar sort of approach. We don't simply want to heat our sample to high temperature and then indent it with a, a probe at room temperature and expect to get reliable results. So this is illustrated by a uh, thermal model. So this is uh, an example of what would happen, a thermal model of where you uh, simulate the contact between a diamond indenter uh, and a, a highly conductive gold sample uh, left at 300 degrees in contact for eight hours. And even after this long uh, equilibration period, you can see really there's some quite uh, considerable um, heat flow, uh, well essentially thermal, uh, steep thermal gradients remain. And this, this proves, uh, would prove quite a problematic in doing high temperature measurements reliably. So the solution to this is to, is to separately actively heat the sample and the indenter. So if we do that by active heating of the indenter together with a uh, thermal management approach to allow us to uh, optimize how we control and stabilize these temperatures. So in the nano test, we separate, have resistant, resistive heaters behind the indenter and the sample. We can monitor these temperatures. We can also monitor the temperature on the, uh, on the surface here with a non-controlling non thermocouple. So we have a very precise measure of what the actual test temperature is. And we can do that with a little insulating shroud. And we create a very localized hot zone which keeps the heat in and so therefore there's a very minimal thermal gradient throughout this sort of uh, localized hot zone and this creates an isothermal contact and this enables us to do very reliable, essentially drift-free measurements with, with thermal drifts that really are very similar at very high temperatures to those more typically associated with room temperature measurements. So as an example, if we put a thermocouple on the surface here and we uh, when we're, when we're heating and measuring at 750 degrees C, then the temperature at the back of 
uh, this hot stage, which where it's attached to the rest of the instrument, will typically be reading about one or two degrees above room temperature. So it's a very localized hot zone. And again, this side where the displacement sensors are, again, is very close to room temperature. And this gives us the confidence to be able to do uh, reliable measurements. So the next issue is the degradation of the indenter. So this can be degradation in contact with samples, or it can be degradation in contact with air. So diamond itself is very reliable when used at high temperature measurements, provided the test temperature remains under about 450, 400 degrees C, as an example here from uh, Jeff Wheeler and Johan Mikler. So this is uh, showing basically a nice, a nice diamond uh, image. But when you go above those temperatures, and particularly in this example here, just a relatively short amount of time, they're quite a high temperature, and even in an argon purging atmosphere at this very high temperature, then you're getting some slight pitting on the diamond indenter. So this is clearly not going to be a beneficial indenter geometry for doing very reliable measurements. Another issue you may have to consider is tribochemistry and uh, reaction basically between chemical reactivity between the indenter and the sample and particularly you do not want to use diamond uh, in contact with ferrous materials at high temperatures because you get dissolution of the carbon into the matrix. So for those type of materials instead you really want to switch to cubic bottle nitride or potentially uh, sapphire or luminous for these uh, high temperature tests. If you want to taste, test nickel-based superalloys, again, sapphire indenters are uh, a useful choice. And for hard coatings, solid oxide fuel cell materials, metallic materials, then typically QP4 and 9 it is, has proved uh, its worth over a number of years. So, as well as indenter uh, sterility, you also need to think about the degradation of the sample. So this is a rather uh, bizarre an extreme example of what might happen in this case to a, a cemented uh, a carbide cutting tool insert and this is simply what happens to the, that uh, sample when uh, when it's oxidized in air uh, at uh, high temperatures and you see this getting some uh, rather dramatic swelling and formation of these uh, brittle porous layers and you can see this sort of thing when you're testing cemented carbide uh, even at somewhat lower temperatures so to test it reliably, you need to switch towards an argon purging uh, environment. It's done. It's going to be done in the NAND test. And here, then, when you do that, here's an example from Lund University. As you can see, the hardness uh, quite nicely drops with temperature, and the error bars on the data. Uh, in fact, in this case, they don't change too much as a function of temperature. And there's no obvious signs of oxidation to about 725 degrees C in this example. I suspect there was probably a little tiny bit of oxidation creeping at the highest temperatures, but uh, argon purging is fairly effective. So moving on to the next example, which is to look at this approach for t with argon purging and uh, cubic bore nitride indenters to test in film systems. This is some work now uh, from Virginia Tech. So again, they're using the argon purge environments so to little um, enclosed uh, argon purging chamber, such as this one here, together with a bore nitride indenter. And here they were looking at the effect of uh, comparing silicon carbide and silicon carbonitrides and looking about their high temperature stability. And here, for example, they can see much bigger differences of these high uh, nitrogen fraction materials. The high temperature stability is much less stable. Uh, much less good mechanical performance at high temperatures than at room temperature. Another example now in this case, looking at uh, CVD alumina as, as part of a multi-layer coating system for a cutting tool application. In this case, is work done uh, with Berkeley. And here, they were contrasting the uh, hardness versus temperature for two different types of uh, alumina coatings alpha alumina and uh, capital alumina. And what we can see here is that the high temperature performance of the uh, alpha alumina is, is better than the capital alumina. And this is important for their uh, cutting tool applications. OK, so to move back to the example I showed earlier, 
and now to, to reveal who, who, which type of coating systems these were. And you can see how, in this case, these two coatings are sodium aluminium nitrite, and a small uh, compositional change of the amount of aluminium fraction in this one here actually gives it much better high temperature stability. It's at the at the cost, actually, of a little bit of uh, room temperature hardness, but it's more than outweighed in terms of the benefits in terms of this high temperature hardness. And indeed, you can go uh, even better by switching towards more uh, complex multi-load systems with uh, greater high temperature uh, hardness and uh, mechanical properties. So, in thin film systems, you know, hard coating thin film systems, typically as the temperature goes up, you, you, you don't particularly get more uh, time-dependent deformation. However, that's not the case for a lot of other materials. And for metallic materials, and also uh, this is a glass, a, a glass uh, ceramic seal material. This is an example, um, I think, from Georgia Tech in this example. And here we can see what's happening during the whole time at peak load uh, at these different test temperatures here. So at a 25 degrees C, there's hardly any creep. 550 degrees C now, there's a little bit more creep. But between 550 and 750, you're seeing a dramatic uh, increase in the amount of creep that you're seeing in this material. So if you're getting this amount of creep, you can imagine then to get reliable elastic modulus measurements afterwards, we need to consider how we we uh, account for that. And we'll come back to that later in the webinar. So, Broadly speaking, hard coatings and metallic alloys have different critical application requirements. Metallic materials, typically, the critical things to control is minimizing or avoiding oxidation and understanding the effect of time dependency and creep on the data. Hard coatings, typically, it's around making sure that your in the indenter does not wear and also avoiding oxidation as well. So the critical issues are is essentially that with time dependency, the elastic contact mechanics may not be valid, and you need to uh, allow for that and, and uh, correct for that, or that the tip geometry changes due to wear at higher temperature. So metals and advanced alloys are very useful for validating the instrumentation performance at high temp test temperature because the elastic modulus of metals is typically known by other test techniques. So it's a very reliable way to cross calibrate. So best practice is to assess the creep rate at the end of the hold period and then decide whether we need to apply any corrections. And also for indented geometry uh, issues to test reference samples, for example, a few silica sample at temperature as well as testing your uh, samples. OK. so. Up until 750 degrees C, cubic bore nitride together with an argon purge has been quite effective at testing thin film systems in the nanotest. But if we want to go a little bit higher, then we need to switch towards high vacuum conditions. So typically with the nanotest vantage, we're limited to a temperature range somewhere around between minus 20 to about 850 or 800 degrees C. C, but if we uh, switch towards a high vacuum yeah, environment in the nantist extreme, then we can achieve a, a dramatic reduction in oxidation. We have the ability now to test diamond at high temperatures where previously it would oxidize, and also to expand the test temperature range. And these, these are very distinct benefits for different applications. So this is uh, an example of the uh, an earlier version of the Nantes Extreme. So this is a uh, one of the prototype ones in the uh, University of Oxford, and the standard instrument was re replaced with vac vacuum compatible components. And there's a, a, a turbo pumps as well to allow you to get to 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7 millibar. And it turns out that radiative heating above 600 degrees provides additional stabilization route for equalizing the tip and sample temperatures. And that becomes increasingly effective and, and rapid above about 850 degrees. So the, the instrument retains the uh, wide load range in the nanotest. We also have the ability to accurately target specific regions by having an in situ SPM stage. And the maximum operating temperature of the system is around 950 degrees. 
Uh, so this is a picture showing the, uh, the heated sample uh, tip from the heated sample glowing at uh, that temperature. So we can use it to look at um, hard coatings. So this is an example on uh, different uh, hard coatings. So this is an illustration of several samples being mounted together on the hot stage, and this this is the appearance of the samples after after they've been up to these high temperatures. And you can see here, for example, this titanium nitride, which has an oxidation onset temperature around sort of 500, 550 degrees, and it's it's looking very nice, even though it's been up to um, 750 degrees for an extended duration. Again, the uh, cemented carbide, which uh, I showed you the example of earlier, again looks completely the same as it did prior to the testing. So it's very good at completely eliminating oxidation. When you come to measurements, you can look and see, for example, differences in hot hardness about uh, due to effects such as binodal decomposition, which is one of those things that people are starting to look at as a way to generate uh, improved cutting tool behavior at higher temperatures. Okay, so in the next section, we're going to be taking the test temperature right up to 950 degrees, and we're going to be using metallic material tungsten to validate the measurements. So the, one of the main benefits in testing at high te uh, in high vacuum is it allows you to test samples that are particularly susceptible to oxidation by other methods uh, in, in other environments. And what you can see here is that tungsten is one of those materials that is particularly sensitive to oxidation effects when uh, up above about 600 degrees or so. And even an hour in argon at 750 degrees was uh, able to completely sort of deposit a thick oh, green oxide uh, on this sample here. And even in a reducing atmosphere such as forming gas, then an hour is able to, again, you're getting some sort of preferential oxidation on some of the uh, grains in, in the tungsten material here. But after an extended period in vacuum of 750 degrees, uh, there was no change to the samples. And indeed, more recently, this is the sample after uh, a different sample, after, a tungsten sample after heating right up to 950 degrees. And again, the sample is essentially coming out looking exactly as it did when before, prior to testing. So when it comes to getting reliable measurements of hardness and elastic modulus, then we use the same thermal uh, stabilization control that I talked about earlier. Uh, I didn't mention, but uh, we, one of the ways we get this very, very low thermal drift is we have a patented approach for uh, in the dual active heating, where we lock the power supply to the indenter heater during the indentation. And this can provide a more uh, stable temperature control than using active PID control for both the sample and the indenter during the indentation process, because the sample and the indenter have different thermal masses. So a typical load history would be one like this. And we've designed this with a faster unload and a hold, a peak load, and we've used essentially an, a modified ISO 145777 approach to allow us to mitigate the effects of time dependency on the elastic modulus. And thermal drift, essentially, we're taking that from a last segment of a, a hold at 90% unloading. So typically there's a small creep recovery period and after which that's, that dies down and then the last segment is it's due uh, solely to any thermal drift. So if we do this, this allows us also to minimize any strain rate effects on the hardness that we manage in the test. So when we do that, we get some nice data. So this is some typical indentation curves on a polycrystalline tungsten sample at 900 degrees C. And they look essentially uh, they're much softer than room temperature, but in terms of the reproducibility, it's very similar to room temperature. That typically, there's a slightly heterogeneous sample, and it's a very similar behavior. And if we now compare across different temperatures, we can see that between 750 and 950, the loading curves really look rather similar. But where the big change occurs is now in the time dependency. So we're seeing here there's a much uh, bigger change in the amount of indentation creep that happens 
during the constant load period at peak load, essentially. We can see that here if we look at essentially creep strain, indentation creep strain, you can see it's fairly constant right up to about 800 degrees, but then when you get to 850, it just goes up and up. So this is exactly what you would expect from the um, high temperature um, microstructural changes that happen in tungsten that's been reviewed quite nicely by Milman. So to validate the high temperature stability and the performance of the instrumentation, the first thing is that we need to have essentially minimized thermal drift throughout the entire test temperature range. And not only do we need to be measuring zero drift, but we need to, to be sure that that is zero drift and it's not somehow that we're measuring a large amount of creep and a large amount of, of, of drift and they're superimposing to give ourselves zero drift. So we need to be sure what is creep and what is drift and then we need to be able to design our experiments cleverly to be able to prove and give ourselves confidence that we really are in a zero drift environment. So if we think about indentation creep and creep recovery, now these are materials processes and these are therefore strongly dependent on the applied load and the loading history and that you can think if you think about uh, testing a polymer at room temperature, then the creep and creep recovery is very, very sensitive to to the to these uh, indentation conditions, and it's the pop the changes in in depth that you get during creep and creep recovery holds are orders of magnitude higher than the underlying thermal drift of the instrumentation. In contrast to that, thermal drift in contact should be essentially insensitive to loading histories. So therefore, if we design some tests, well, if firstly, if we give ourselves some confidence that the thermal drift remains very close to zero throughout the temperature range, but also that this is in no way dependent on the loading history that we use in the test, then I think we can be pretty confident that the result is not affected by any materials response and we really have got a, a, a system that is as stable at 950 degrees as it is at room temperature. So this is an example here. So this shows three different tests at uh, 850 degrees, uh, 160, 230 and 300 millinewtons. Another three tests at 900 degrees at the same loads. So these, this is, what, what we're doing here is we're monitoring the the depth change during a 60 second hold at 90% on load that we would normally use to assess thermal drift. And what we can see is essentially in this first segment there's a little bit of creep recovery as you can see the highest, the highest temperature and the greatest load and you'll see the, the biggest material recovery. But after that and this very soon sort of finishes and after that you're basically left with the underlying drift of the instrumentation which is essentially fairly close it's around 0 0.05 nanometers a second for all of these different uh, loading conditions. This confirms the accuracy of the thermal drift and the reliability of the data. So when you do that, you might get typical hardness measurements on tungsten looking something like this. And when we then compare with different uh, hardness measurements that have done previously, by non-depth sen sensing techniques in vacuum. Initially, you might, uh, there's not that much data, but where you do have data to compare, you might get something like this. And this looks a little bit uh, messy to start with because you have different initial hardness at room temperature, which means it's a little bit difficult to compare across the study. Studies in particular, you get an indentation size effect in the nano indentation data compared to the micro indentation compared to the micro-indentation data. But when you, when you normalize, essentially normalize by the room temperature hardness, um, then, you, then essentially you can um, allow for the different uh, work hardening and the different crystallinity in these different tungsten samples and the different applied loads. And you're getting a very clear uh, constant trend between the nano-indentation and the micro-indentation data here. In this current study here, we've extended, extended this to higher load. So I think we're quite confident now 
that we've validated the hardness part of the exercise. The next step, which is more challenging, is to, color, to validate the elastic modulus part. So the first thing we can do is we can, we can obtain the reduced modulus from a standard uh, Oliver file type unloading analysis, then convert this to what, to what we expect uh, based on the temperature dependent Poisson's ratio and elastic moduli for the indenter and the Poisson's ratio and elastic modulus for the sample itself. And then we can see how accurate this is, is and then we can also see whether we need to apply any corrections. So when we do that, as I say, we, we have to account for these temperature dependent changes. So the elastic modulus of the indenter itself decreases by about 4% over that temperature range. The sample modulus decreases by about 10%. Poisson's ratio essentially is invariant with temperature. And if we do, if we look, then we actually find at up to about 800 degrees, the, the results are quite good. But then when we go up to about 800 degrees, 850 and above, then we find that typically they can be anything to 20 or 30% too high. So this is because the time dependency at these high temperatures is not being accounted for in the uh, standard unloading analysis. And you're getting continued time-dependent deformation occurring during unloading. So what you do then is you apply a standard correction to this uh, unloading data to, apply, to determine the uh, unloading compliance based on this uh, indenter displacement rate at the end of the, of the holding period just immediately prior to unloading. And if you do this, then the correction basically means that you get within to about 5% to 850 and 6% of the theoretical value at 950 degrees. And I think that's pretty good. So I think this, this small difference, I think, is down to a slight increase in the amount of pileup which we see, which is, again, not uh, taken into account in the standard analysis. That pileup is a little bit temperature, typically a little bit temperature sensitive as well. So to summarize on the metallic, uh, on the tungsten study, we validated right across this uh, temperature range. Typical thermal drift is very low. Hardness and elastic modulus are now um, consistent with literature values. But you need to make a correction, particularly at these very high uh, temperatures, because of the effect of increased creep. So moving on, 950 degrees is a nice temperature, but it's, it's not quite high enough for some applications. And we are working to go higher. So in this last uh, section, I'll talk about higher temperatures and also different types of test tests which we've also been able to achieve with the NAND test system. So this is an updated version of the figure you saw earlier. Now you can see now there's some additional crosses here. So we've got a couple of crosses now at 950. And this one here is now uh, in, in submitted now from one of our customers in uh, Arken. And they presented some work at ICMCTF this year where they were looking at um, creep in uh, nickel-based uh, M. Crowley bond coats in a, a gas turbine engine here. So they were looking at uh, the mechanical properties of the high temperature creep of these, this uh, bond coat. So here you can see now they've achieved 1,000 degrees and in the short-term creep test, you can see that, uh, again, immediately prior to these temperatures, it's fairly, fairly minimal creep. And then again, once you get up to about 700 degrees, it starts to creep, and then, right, and then it's creeping a lot. And this is consistent with the quoted uh, operating range for these uh, Avon coats, which is about uh, 1,050. So this was achieved with an out test system in a high vacuum environment. And when you look, although these are only short-term uh, tests, nevertheless, you can apply uh, if you like, you can apply stress exponent modeling and then you can determine, for example, how this compares with other studies. And you can see across the temperature range it's fairly consistent with uh, values determined by other studies. So I think we have quite a workable technique now to, to go to these very high test temperatures. So we have a uh, newer version now of our nanotest extreme, and this is an example of one of them. Master Maximum temperature with this is at 900 degrees or 950 degrees or so. 
and we have internal uh, development and collaboration projects to achieve uh, 1,000 to 1,200 degrees C, and uh, we're, work is ongoing at the moment there. So as well as indentation, we can also we can also do other types of nanomechanical tests. So this one, this is testing some simple example testing uh, a multi-component nitride film. So this is looking at the uh, friction coefficient in this case in uh, low load sliding against tungsten carbide probe. And in this case, this is done in an, without atmospheric control. And in this uh, system at room temperature, you've got a very uh, quite a low uh, friction. A higher higher temperature, you get some uh, some increased in, in friction. And then at a higher temperature, still the film is uh, degrading and oxidizing, and you're getting what potentially is a combination of a lubricious titanium oxide uh, sort of film. But also it's rutile and it's it's not that well adhered, and you're getting some flaking. And so this is a poorly adhered oxide film, so you're sliding over this poorly adhered film, and that's what's giving you this variability to the friction trace in this very high temperature. So this sort of nanotribology, I think, will be becoming increasingly popular. Another type of thing you can look at is to look at the temperature dependence of um, microcompression tests, which are becoming increasingly popular. So, for example, you can look at silicon, which is a very brittle material at uh, room temperature. So this is some work from uh, Cambridge University a few years back now. And here they use their nanotest system to compress uh, micro pillars of, in, in a silicon at different test temperatures and a completely brittle fracture at room temperature. But then when you heat it up, even only, surprisingly, only to 400 degrees, then you're starting to get a transition towards more uh, ductile behavior. And you can also do micro cantilever bend tests where you're essentially using the fib to create a fib to create um, little uh, cantilever uh, bend bars. And then we use the in-situ nanopositioning stage to create an image using the tip to raster over the, the area and create an image of the sample at whilst at temperature. So this is like a, effectively like a high temperature AFM image. And we can use this in, image to accurately position where we want to do the indentation tests or the bend tests. So this image is then stored in the instrument software and we can go click, click, click and choose exactly where we want to do. And this allows us, I say, these in situ imaging capability allows us to accurately position the indenter and then to perform these bend tests and therefore to understand differences in elastic modulus and ductility with different uh, test temperatures. And this work is, has been done more recently at Oxford University uh, by Dave Armstrong and Ed Tarleton, uh, looking at uh, right up to 770 degrees Celsius. So this is an example of the sort of thing you might guess. So uh, these example here, these two different test temperatures at 100 and 10 degrees, it's a brittle response, linear elastic loading, and then suddenly it fractures. Whilst above the brittle ductile transition, then you're getting some plasticity in a much more gradual deformation. And by looking at test temperatures in between these ranges, in this case, the, the uh, authors can, at Oxford were able to determine that the onset for brittle ductile uh, behavior in their, in their system was around uh, 530 Celsius. And they're also able to pull out temperature-dependent yield stresses and elastic modulus. OK, well, thank you very much for uh, listening today. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, a range of people there on, on the left who are all contributed to this, this work. Uh, thanks very much to all of those people there. And for people interested in more uh, information about some of these uh, Results using these high temperature test capability, I say, we have a wide amount of publications from our user, uh, our user base, many of which are reviewed in this, uh, this publication on the top here. And the more recent work taking the t test temperature right up to 950 degrees, there's a couple of papers out uh, shown here. So, in all that I've shown, hopefully I've given you the flavor about how we developed our instrumentation so we can essentially test the mechanical and tribological behavior of our materials 
more close to their operating conditions than is more is might be tip more typical uh, in, in nanomechanics, and we believe that uh, the results are much more relevant towards optimizing performance for these uh, applications. And we're gaining, and our customers are gaining, a, a much improved understanding of the links between these high temperature properties and the performance of these uh, material systems for these increasingly demanding applications. OK, thank you. Thank you, Ben, for the uh, presentation. We're going to finish today um, just by doing a, a quick review of the instrumentation used um, for all of the data shown in today's presentations. Um, first of all, the, our flagship instrument, the Nanotest Vantage, which has been used, uh, which has dual loading heads, so it can cover a range of loads from 10 micronewtons to 30 newton over two heads. The key feature of the nanotest vantage is its flexibility so it's also multi-technique uh, allowing us to do nano indentation which was discussed in great detail uh, in today's presentation but also nano scratch and wear testing high strain rate nano impact testing as well as nano fretting high cycle wear testing in addition to the techniques available we also have multiple environments that we can test in we can test at high temperatures up to 800 degrees low temperature down to minus 20 degrees, in liquids, in purged atmospheres as mentioned in today's presentation, and in controlled humidities. The other instrument uh, talked about in today's presentation was the Nanotex Extreme. This is our dedicated vacuum nano indentation system. This has been designed from scratch to allow us to perform experiments at the extremes of temperature. So on this instrument we have a wider testable temperature range from beyond 950 degrees on the high temperature side down to minus 40 on the cold side but what we sacrifice is a little bit of flexibility so while we can still perform technique experiments in purge atmospheres and now in vacuum we lose the ability to do controlled humidities and in liquids so what we suggest is that this instrument is really most suitable for people looking to do experiments uh, the highest and lowest temperatures possible. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our attendees for their attention uh, for today's webinar and just to say that the webinar itself will be put up on our website in the next few days, our website being www.micromaterials.co.uk and we'll send a reminder around to all of our attendees to let you know once the webinar is online. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please contact us on info at micromaterials.co.uk. Thank you very much.